Welcome to this virtual meeting of the DEI scrutiny panel. Can I remind all participants that normal rules, normal rules of procedure apply? For example, comments, question, for example, co sorry, I've got a slight stammer coming on. For example, any comments and questions need to be that any comments or questions need to be put through the chair uh, as we are meeting virtually. Um, the proceedings the, the, as we are meeting virtually, the proceedings may may take slightly longer, especially when I keep on stammering. So your patience is appreciated. Um, whilst members of the public can view this meeting via YouTube live, they will not be able to actively participate or comment on proceedings. As this meeting is being live streamed, can I remind all participants that their conduct should, should reflect this? Uh, the first agenda item is apologies for absence. I'm not aware that we have any, but would anyone like to put any apologies? Um, I think we've we got full attendance today. Yes, Chair, everyone's present. That's great, thank you. Uh, agenda item number two is declarations of interest. Uh, have we got any declarations? Nope. No, that's brilliant, I can't see any. Um, okay, agenda item number three are the minutes from the last meeting held on the 3rd of November. Um, would anyone like to move them as being read? Um, I was, I, would anyone like to move them as being um, as being accurate, or is there any any dissenting voices? Or free to move them, chair. Thank you. Uh, Second, the chair. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, right. So we're coming to agenda item number four. Um, what I would like to do, with the panel's permission, is reorder the agenda item from. Uh, agenda right, we, we start with agenda item number five, then agenda item number four, six, seven, and eight. And the reason for this is that the director of regeneration has had a clash of meetings and will be basically joining as soon as soon as possible. So, with the panel's permission, or is anyone with any any objections to that? No. Really right. okay. So in that case, we'll move on from four straight to number five, and that is the green strategy review, land use and wildlife. And um, as a guest speaker, we have the head of um, head of planning is in attendance to provide an overview of Middlesbrough Council's land use and wildlife sustain sustainable water action group. Um, so I think that's you, isn't it, Paul? That's correct. Thank you, Chair. If it's all right with you, I'll start sharing my screen if I can remember how to do this. I, I prepared a short presentation to, to run through uh, basically what we're doing. Um, so if you, if you bear with me one moment. Uh, uh, see if I'll share the right screen. Ah, there we go. Can everybody see that? Okay, brilliant. Right. Okay, well, I, I, pre I prepared a short presentation for this. Um, I'll email this across to Sue after this so that you've all got copies of that if, if you wish. Apologies for not getting it across before the meeting. Um, but what I'd like to do, if that's okay, is just give you a bit of background in terms of the group, where it relates to the green strategy, um, and then run through um, one of the things that we have done as a council. We've um, recently adopted the Green Blue Infrastructure Strategy, which um, flows out of the green strategy and it provides a lot of the framework for what we're doing within the group. Um, so I, I then want to move on from that, what the key themes are we're looking to tackle, what they are, um, and run you through some of those actions which we've um, have been undertaken and what we're proposing to do over the next couple of years and so forth. That's okay, Chair. So obviously the green strategy, where this rests, um, we brought two theme groups together, the um, or two of the one planet living principles together, land use and wildlife and sustainable water. The key areas of the green strategy which um, impact upon um, our group is uh, the improving the quality and increasing the amount of green space um, within the town, increasing tree cover of the town, um, planting trees along tree, um, road corridors to increase pollution absorption, uh, provide um, a greater level of carbons captured through increased tree cover, increased amount of land given over to wildflowers, and become a more bee friendly town through better awareness. Um, one of the things that um, we have done in, in planning, we commissioned something called Green Blue Infrastructure Strategy because we felt that um, taking a local plan forward, we really needed to have a better understanding of the green and the blue elements and that we would want to develop a local plan around us. It sits actually quite nicely under the green strategy. 
and uh, basically um, what that's done that that breaks down the, the these elements into to six key themes um, those themes are regeneration heritage and sense of place biodiversity and geodiversity reconnecting communities with nature a resilient landscape the blue network and waterfront and walking and cycling. Uh, in essence, what we're saying is we really want to put the green blue infrastructure. So it's the, the open space, the green look, links, the becks, the suds, ponds and so forth at the heart of um, what we're trying to achieve um, through what we're doing. We see it's been critical uh, and key in delivering the key elements of the green strategy. That it lends itself to a number of objectives within that, that strategy, um, which lend themselves, I say, quite well to the um, the green strategy. And I won't go won't go through those in detail there, but there, there are quite clear links between that and what, what we've um, adopted in that strategy. Um, through that, what we have done, we've identified six key objectives and themes for the group. And these are basically expanding the urban tree network, laying the foundations for the nature recovery network, blue corridors enhancing the Beck Valleys, developing a network of multifunctional sustainable urban drainage systems, rethinking urban grasslands, and embedding the principles of the green strategy and the green blue infrastructure strategy into policy and new development. Now, taking each one of those in turn, um, expanding the urban tree network, this obviously is a key element of the green strategy, um, increasing tree cover in the town. It is recognised that Middlesbrough does have a quite a low representation of trees, coverage of trees, reflecting in part its, its urban nature. It is the most urbanised of the Tees Valley authorities. Um, obviously, the mayor set up um, a, a plan to deliver 10,000 trees per annum. Uh, I believe we're on course to, to deliver that. Um, we're looking to continue that tree planting uh, program across the borough where we can. And from my perspective as um, head of planning, when we're looking at planning decisions as well, we're looking to encourage that planting and seek additional planting, planting through development schemes. Um, so hopefully um, as part of that, it's not just the trees that we are planting, but also additional trees which come through from development. The, there's also the, the potential, we're looking at um, the microforests coming forward and um, again I think um, uh, all members are invited to identify micro potential microforests within their wards um, as potential locations um, so there's currently work going on to identify those sites and come up with a program for um, implementing that, that, those forests we have applied to the tree cities of the world and achieved it um, we are, I think for me, a key element uh, about tree planting, increasing that urban tree network, is not just planting the trees, but making sure that they're the right trees and the right tree management arrangements are in place. Um, it's ensuring that uh, they, they do survive, they're healthy. Um, the council does have its tree policy in place. Obviously, that will be monitored and amended as required, as, um, as experience shows that we, we may need to look at that again. But at this moment in time, that's in place um so we work you know so that's up and running but we'll we look at that um, as things go see if things need to be changed nature recovery network in terms of um, laying the fundamentals for for this the, the kit the heart of this is um, biodiversity um you may or may not heard there's a lot going on about biodiversity at the moment there's the environmental act going through parliament um, there have been changes to the planning, um, national planning policy framework about na national um, biodiversity net gain as well. Um, uh, and the key actions that we've identified as a group um, and in terms of achieving that biodiversity is that we continue to seek options and opportunities for new nature reserves in the borough. Um, we have a couple. Um, obviously, this is looking at is there potential for any more? And we will work with the, the Tees Valley Nature Partnership in identifying. Um, future um, nature reserves uh, there's the green re green recovery project the green green shoots project which is looking at three of our local wildlife sites and looking at um, how they can be restored and managed so they would prioritize three of our local wildlife sites they are Middlebeck, Ormsby Beck and Martin Westbeck. So they are priorities at the moment. Um, there's a one year program looking at um, delivering that. Um, we're also advised the, I, I don't know if you're aware, there's the Tees Valley Nature Partnership, um, 
what they do. They, they represent um, the nature forums across the Tees Valley. Um, I sit on the steering group of that partnership as part of that. Um, they identify and make recommendations for local wildlife sites in each of the um, five authorities in their, in their area. Um, there are three in Middlesbrough which have been recommended. Um, these are at uh, Middlemarsh over at um, North Ormsby where the, the, the Ormsby Beck goes through um, behind the, um, the Six Medals, um, that area between um, Chemoxy and um, Six Medals. There's St Joseph's Cemetery and there's also um, the Verge, Grass Verges on the Stainton Way through Colby Newham. So we're currently working at um, identifying those as local wildlife sites and um, getting them designated as such. One of the issues is that local wildlife sites need to be designated through the planning process. So they need to be designated through the local plan. So we're looking to, to get in place in, in part of the local plan review, the policy framework to protect these sites and also um, to designate the new ones um, through that process. Um, in the meantime, we're also looking at the, the potential of, um, some of you may or may not remember, uh, many years ago, we had something called um, a local nature strategy, which looked at all the local wildlife sites, um, potentially um, bringing that back. Um, so we've got a particular strategy which just looks at those sites. So we've got that in place before the local plan is there. So we've got a tool, a document which sets out um, each one of those. Um, we're also looking as part of that, the management plans for each of the local wildlife sites. It's great designating wildlife sites, but obviously what we need to do is make sure that they're managed effectively. Um, and they're not just designated, we do manage them. We not only maintain the level of uh, biodiversity and interest there, but we actually look to enhance it where we can. And I think that's quite important. Um, I'll come back on that again. I'll talk about biodiversity in that gain. I have the Stainsby Country Park down there because it obviously um, an allocation in the local plan to Stainsby development. Within that, we've identified the, the um, country park as a key element, key key piece of strategic open space. Um, we are in um, discussions with developers about bringing sites forward. And obviously, a key element of that is we need to look at how we can bring that country park forward, what it will look like, what it needs to involve. So. That is a long term project. It won't be something which we dealt with overnight. It is a longer term project. Um, biodiversity net gain. Um, one of the things which will come through the Environment Act is, um, will be a requirement that as development comes forward, there will be an expectation that it will develop, deliver 15% biodiversity net gain. So in essence, what we're looking at is as a development site happens, we measure what the biodiversity is on that site and we would expect a 15% enhancement of that biodiversity level. The um, DEFRA have produced a number of tools and metrics for measuring what um, biodiversity levels are. And what, I, what I'm looking at is looking at how that would apply in Middlesbrough. We, and um, what, not only how we measure biodiversity, but how we're going to deliver that net gain. The approach I'm looking to adopt is that we um, seek to deliver biodiversity net gain on site first. So where the development occurs, I'd expect to see that net gain there. If it's not capable of delivering it on that site, we will then look to take it onto sites elsewhere in Middlesbrough. If it can't be delivered in Middlesbrough, we will then look at Tees Valley. And if it can't, and only if it can't be delivered to Tees Valley, would we look more broader than that? Um, so we're, we're we're looking at, and I'm also working with colleagues in um, my neighbouring authorities in Tees Valley to try and get a consistent approach and a strategic approach across the Tees Valley and how we're going to deliver this. Um, but there are, it is a potentially it is a mechanism as well, whereby we can take money out of development and put it into some of our local wildlife sites to enhance them and increase our biodiversity. So it is a means of actually getting some form of funding to improve our wildlife sites as well and to, to help maintain and manage them better. Um, and another requirement through um, Environment Act is going to be local nature recovery strategies. Um, not quite sure what this is going to look like yet. Potentially, this will be at a Tees Valley level rather than at um, a local level in Middlesbrough. Um, but we will be at that table looking at what that looks like across the Tees Valley and the work we do in biodiversity net gain will then look at how how that is translated into something for Middlesbrough. A, 
a key element for me is uh, quite often when we talk about green infrastructure, we, we forget about the blue elements. Uh, Middlesbrough has a series of Beck Valleys, which uh, run like fingers north, south, and actually create green corridors running from the south of the town to the north, lead, feeding into the River Tees. I think they're a very important resource. Um, which we need to to tap into, enhance, improve, not only for biodiversity, but also for recreational purposes as well, providing those those key links. Uh, so one of the things that we're we're looking at, we we haven't set um tasks for these yet, but this is something which we're obviously we continue to looking to develop some of these these issues as we we move forward. But it's how we look at improving the quality of our water courses, looking at seeking opportunities to develop greater access and interpretation. Um, for some of those. Um, one of the things I'm very keen on is preparing and adopting a sustainable urban drainage system design guide. Um, for that, um, it's an expectation that developments will incorporate SUDs within them. What I'm looking at is um, ensuring that we create those SUD schemes so they're more natural in their look. Um, I, I don't know if many of you are aware of the um, the pond, the village pond at Great House Farm, the uh, Dade Wilson development down at Nunthorpe. Um, that is part of the SUD scheme there. You, so you, it's been developed as a village pond. It looks like a village pond. You have a number of reels and swales which follow, flow alongside the, uh, the roads to take some of the flood water. They create a natural feature. So there's no reason why they cannot be incorp incorporating developments. We've recently run appeal decisions uh, because developers have put in engineered SUDs and inspectors says no, they should be more naturalistic. So we're looking at preparing design guidance as part of that. I'm looking at revisiting our urban design framework um, for design generally. And so I'm looking at incorporating a specific section within that to incorporate um, the SUDS elements um, within that. Um, and the key for me is also ensuring that the SUDS are incorporated as integral elements in development proposals. So they're designed from the outset. They're not included as add-ons at a later stage. Oh, we need to put this in. So we're going to put the last piece of open space. No, you design developments around the green elements and, and it works that way. Um, rethinking urban grasslands. This is primarily about re-looking at our amenity grasslands, highway verges. Do we need to mow them as much as we used to mow them? Can we not turn them across to um, wide, fly, wide flower meadows, rewilding? Uh, obviously, one of the key uh, objectives identifying the green strategies are about making us more bee friendly and by uh, improve by cutting back on the, the mowing regimes, um, allow planting more wildflower meadows. It's actually increasing pollinator uh, pollen, uh, pollinator trails for, for bees and so forth. So work is underway that the council has adopted a, a regime where it is um, um, cutting less and putting in more um, wildflower meadows as well. And finally, the last thing I have here is um, about embedding the principles, of the green strategy and the green bloom structure into policy and what the council does. So it's not just about the actions and, and doing things. It's also about how we put embed it into our, our wider policies. Um, we've already done the first. So we've adopted the green blue infrastructure strategy. The council adopted that earlier this year. I think that was probably back in April, May time we adopted that. Um, I, if you've not seen it, I'll send you the links along with the presentation. I think it's a quite key document for us. Uh, and for me, it is a, an absolute critical element for the local plan review and will underpin a lot of what we're trying to achieve. And I was looking to integrate it throughout um, th those aspirations. Because it's not just talking about the elements I've talked here, it's also looking at um, how we um, green the town centre, looking at uh, Middle Haven as well, and how we engage with communities and so on and so forth. Um, so again, the urban design framework, look at updating that, and it's gonna be a key element of our master plans as we take them forward. Um, and finally there, I'm looking at developing and implementing a green blue infrastructure checklist for new developments, so that when officers sit down with developers, to to look at um, developments they come forward with a checklist of the, have you considered this have you considered that so so we can make sure that the green and the blue infrastructure and the green strategy is the forefront of these development decisions when they come forward um, so it's it's a key consideration um, that chair was a quick ramble and run through 
what we need to to answer any questions that people may have uh, i may not know the answers but i probably know a man who does so if need be i'll have to come back at some point thank you very much for that presentation that was really good thank you um first question that i can see and from councillor morston thank you chair just a couple of comments really um when i came to middleton in 1964 the, it was totally polluted. Um, you you got dirty just walking along Newport Road, and anybody that fell in the River Tees had to be given a cocktail of drugs at the hospital to make sure they saved the lives. Um, just a couple of comments on the tree planting. Um, I'm pleased to see that you're building in a, a maintenance plan. We're suffering badly in South Middlesbrough and, and other areas of the town from tree planting in the 1970s without any thought to the future and residents have been faced with bills for having um, trees pruned that are overhanging their own gardens albeit the trees are owned by the council so I'm, I'm pleased on that bit late but better late than never um, to the point on on wildflowers on Stanton Way in similar areas that's that's a fantastic idea um, I suggested years ago when Hartlepool were doing their great effort along the year 689 and it was thrown out as being too expensive. Um, now we have wildflower plan planning, which is a way of saving the council money and making areas look even better. So every success on the wildflower. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, that was just comments. I think, but I, I suppose there's nothing um, that you need that you need to reply to on that, Paul. But if there's if there's anything that you want to say. Um, no, I, I think you're yeah, absolutely spot on there, Tom, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I think I said in the presentation that it's the right tree in the right place as much as anything else. It's not just about tree planting. It's making sure we get the right tree in the right environment in the right place. Uh, and likewise, you, it, to me, it's not just about, OK, we're planting trees, we're designating local wildlife sites. It's about how we manage and maintain that going forward. And it's important that we do that because if we don't, it kind of works against us because it loses its value. It starts to degrade. Um, so I think it's it's not just a case of, look, we're setting this up, we're doing this, it's about how we manage and maintain it going forward and ensuring we have the, the resources to, to do that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Branson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, it, it could be new. Um, we're actually at the point now putting together a neighbourhood plan. Mm -hmm. um, and what we want to do really is to make sure that we maximise uh, the amount of, of cobinuum uh, that is uh, kept green rather than used for housing. We understand that housing development is something that's likely to come along. I, I was very interested you mentioned about Martin Westbeck because Martin Westbeck is really mm -hmm. um, the area that we will be looking to see uh, some expanded uh, uh, planting of trees if, if there's an area to be um, because there's that wooded area there could be suitably expanded yeah. uh, and also what we would like to see is this incorporated into some kind of um, country park in the same way yeah. as as, uh, as at Stainsby. Mm -hmm. um, we just started the process. In fact, we will actually be kicking it off at the next community council meeting. Excellent. As such. Um, but I just wondered, you mentioned Martin Westbeck, and of course, Martin Westbeck affects us in Colby Newham as it does in, mm. in Martin West, as it's the boundary. Um, mm. What what have, has been done so far, and, and who have you been dealing with on, on this? But I'm not really sure uh, whether we need to know about this in Colby Newham. Um, and, and what we need to know. Now, I've spoken to Ian Wilson about mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the wooding the area, but I haven't had anything direct about Martin Westman. Uh, I, I, to be honest, Councillor Branson, I. I not the best person to to answer that question in terms of um what you know who you need to speak to about the beck at the moment i think simon simon blenkinsop will obviously do a lot in terms of local wildlife site stuart muir williams on the um the water quality the water environment um i will say that you know i'm quite happy to speak to them i'm looking at um, working with um, both of them and the and the um, cleveland wildlife trust looking at the management plans and the maintenance regimes for for those areas and coming up with a program and a series of plans for them, um, trying to make them as user friendly as we can, because obviously what we don't want to have 
is big bulky documents which just sit on the shelf. So we, we kind of want to, to make them usable to people. In terms of the, you know, as you could quite really say, Martin West Beck, there runs between, basically between Colby Newham and uh, Martin West. Um, there is the housing allocation and local plan for Newham Hall. Um, that does have within it quite um, recommendation for quite significant wildlife and landscaping belts, including the Martin West Beck. And I think there's an opportunity as that comes forward that we can use that development to see how we can enhance uh, I know it almost sounds like a perverse thing to say, but it's how we can use that development to, to enhance the uh, value of that corridor. Um, the, 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 obviously, there will be an issue that as development comes forward, it put more pressure on that corridor as recreational resource. So that needs to be managed in its own right. But it's how it's made. Uh, it's, it's the same as in Stainsby. I want to make sure that we get the green elements right and everything else will then fall in behind that. So it's the green elements which dictate what form that development takes. So let's look at the proposals you're talking about for the, the uh, neighbourhood plan, what your requirements are and how we can form that. Take that forward into its own master plan, which will then be used to um, provide um, those green elements which you're, you're looking for. The, the point I'm making here is we're looking to design the, uh, the neighbourhood plan now what would be of, of, of use to, 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 to us is to be able to sit down with somebody mm. to talk about Martin West yeah. and, and look at the plans and look at what's at, yeah. at possible. Is it is it Simon I should be um, well, speaking to? Or, or what to, or, yeah. well, I suggest, if it's all right with you, Councillor Brands, if, if you leave that with me, I, I'll start saying, I'll start that ball rolling for you if that's okay. And uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so I. Lovely. I because obviously, um, bearing in mind it, it is aligned to the, the, the neighbourhood plan, I'd like to stay involved in that, both in, in terms of neighbourhood plan side of things and also um, the green strategy side of things. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that we can, can work together to come up with what you are looking for. And I'm sure between us, we can identify what is needed and what can go into the neighbourhood plan, how we can achieve your aspirations as a community as well. Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to being contacted. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Coop. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think Paul knows what I'm going to say. Uh, Milers Wood and that area, um, there was discussions quite some time ago to make that designated wildlife and mm -hmm. no development, etc. I wonder how, I know it's part of the neighbourhood plan and we talked about that the other day. I just wondered uh, how we can proceed with that to make sure that as much as that sway the we notice Marlers Wood, there's also yep. the high rift field, etc., to, to sort of get that as protected as we possibly can. Yeah, I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Coop, is that um, the the neighbourhood plan seeks to designate it as local green space. I think that's. Yeah, I think that's what. Uh, uh, I, that I believe does give it quite a significant degree of protection. Um, as such, I think also um, the other levels of protection which will come with it is, is, is as it's in council ownership, we do have the ownership uh, protection as well um, to to help prevent um, inappropriate development within that. I think, uh, again, uh, uh, it, it's as much about management and improving access to it. You know, you want access to these sites, but you don't want necessarily that access to damage the value of them. Um, so it's, it's ensure, ensuring that people have the proper access, but that access managed, and also that the woodland itself is maintained and managed pro appropriately. Yes, thanks. Because we've been having that done recently with work with Middlesex Council to to sort out some of the pathways and things in Marlis Wood. So uh, yes, so we want that to continue in perpetuity. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, uh, Councillor Arundel. Um, yeah, your agenda. Thanks, Chair. Um, a comment as much as anything, and a question to add. Although this is just a flavour of the month, this, this strange stuff. I mean, I've been working with um, the Friends Group down on Blowbell Beck for about 10 years. We've done a lot of work down there, uh, including on the meadows, which now seem to have been claimed by other bodies for whatever reason. Um, in fact, about a year ago, um, bumped into a couple from Thornaby who were sat on one of the seats that we provided. And they said, what a wonderful place this is. We didn't realise it was here. And we shall continue to do that, regardless of what happens mm. with the local plan. Mm. Um, we were hoping and looking forward to um, joining up with the 
the country park, which is part of the local plan. But we're quite concerned with the threat to that with, with, mm -hmm. with the mayor's refusal to sign off the local plan and the threat to modify it um, to, to suit whatever purpose he has. So that's that. But going on to the other ones with micro forests and the trees, some time ago I walked um, with one of your colleagues um, round the ward, particularly the area um, on Sandy Flats where the, the, the new flood um, prevention scheme was, in, was, 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 was put in. It's a huge hole in the ground to retain water <clears throat> and it lends itself very well to micro forests. And, mm -hmm. and I suggested that we could plant quite a number of those around there and blend them in because the environment um, agency apparently are supposed to be planting trees around the yeah. perimeter of that site. And I actually was hoping this, that that could happen in this dormant season now mm -hmm. because they've known about that for quite some mm -hmm. time. That's been part of their, their, their commitment you know, on that site. So mm -hmm. I was hoping that that would be happening this year because that's a year again. I don't know if there is any any most for that to be progressed this, this, this year or the back end of this year into next year in the dormant season. Perhaps you can tell me, uh, Paul. I, I've, I've asked a question um, and I'm, I'm trying to find out for you, Councillor Arundel, in terms of what's happening with that. Um, yes, my understanding is, is correct. The Environment Agency are planning to, to plant trees um, in that flood um, facility location. Um, well, I think one of the issues for us is that I'm not quite sure Excuse me, I'm not quite so sure that we can because I think it might third, be third party land, has to trust land as opposed to, to council owned. So we can't just go planting tree willy nilly on um, other people's land. We can only really go and do it on our land. But the Environment Agency are doing it as part of the flood, flood scheme. So they will potentially be doing it as part of that. But certainly, I think there are opportunities um, along all, you know, for me, it's all about ensuring that where these opportunities are, that they're all linked up, things aren't done in isolation. There is um, an overall strategy in terms of what we're trying to achieve, and the, potentially the, um, you know, you know, some of the parts is greater than the whole type type approach. So it's it's how they all link together, and likewise going back to what you were saying about the the elements of Bluebell Beck and so forth, uh, and clinging that to the, the country park. And, you know, from my perspective, that's still an aspiration. I'm still looking at doing that. And those elements which are there already, we probably won't be touching, just seeing how we can incorporate them in and maybe improve accessibility. Um, but certainly, um, go, you know, in terms of uh, planting this, this dormant season, the question's been asked, and I'm just, just waiting for feedback in terms of, um, of where we are on that. Thank okay. you. Um, uh, Councillor Saunders? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Two things, if I can, uh, Chair. It's just... Uh, Going back to the local, wild, local wildlife sites, uh, Paul, um, mm -hmm. we're very fortunate in our ward. We have uh, three three becks, I believe. Yes, um, Middle Beck, Audrey Beck, and Spencer Beck. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if they were they were, would could be considered for one of for these local wildlife sites. There's a lot I... of space on all of them, particularly Ormsby Beck, which runs from our path from uh, Ladgate Lane right down to the white. The white, the white bridge, um, and just want your thoughts on that. Um, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah apologies. apologies. I've not got the plan. I've, I've not got the plans in front of me, but certainly I know um, Ormsby Beck is a um, local wildlife site. I think part of it's also like a local nature reserve. Um, so certainly that that is that is protected as such. Um, I believe part of Middle Beck is as well. I, I'd have to double check that. I do have a document which lists them all and has plans for them all. Again, I'm more than happy to share um, with members uh, as to what they are and what that is. Um, it's available on our um, local plan website under our, um, I believe it's available under our local plan website under our evidence library, but I'm more than happy to send links and copies of that document to, to members. Um, one of the things about local wildlife sites is that they have to meet certain criteria. So we can't we can't just go and designate them as we as we so wish. The recommend what normally ha the process what how it normally happens is a recommendation is made to the <coughs> excuse me the Tees Valley Nature Partnership, who then assess it. They have a panel which assesses each um, application. <coughs> excuse me, and then they make recommendations to each planning authority as to whether it should be a local wildlife site or not. And then we, at the first opportunity, will incorporate it in our local plans. 
but certainly if there are <clears throat> if you think there are sites which are worthy of designation then i'm happy to to work with colleagues to to look at that and um, what can and can't be um, designated thanks paul can i just ask another well it's a comment more on this chair yeah it's just yeah. on the town in general paul i'm just you know we talked about this green strategy and getting the town green um it's just this controversial thing about the pond near the, near the uh, law courts mm -hmm. that, that, that could be filled in and developed on. Uh, I think that that could be going by all the rules, by the rule book. So what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, permission has been granted um, for that. As part of that permission, there was um, an ecological assessment submitted by the applicant. Um, we had that assessed by the Cleveland Wildlife Trust, um, who advised us on the value of that pond. Um, so they were quite, uh, sorry, they were content the, with the assessment done that the ecological value wasn't that great. What we have done as part of, we also recognised um, at Planning Committee um, that the value of that area wasn't just an ecological value of the pond, but also the amenity space which is provided and one of the conditions that we've attached to that um, application because it was only outlined at that stage at this stage was that we have put on a condition about biodiversity net gain so we would expect to see an enhancement of biodiversity over and above what's there at the moment when the development actually comes forward and we also want to see how amenity space of an equivalent value is incorporated into the development um, so there's still a lot uh, uh, if I put this, um, if I put this, a lot of water to go onto the bridge with that one at the moment. So, yes, whilst the permission, the outline permission does show that potentially that pond will disappear, uh, because the the way that the scheme was shown was that that was going to be built over and be part of a car park and part of a development. That we haven't, you know, until we see the details of that um, reserve matters application, it's difficult for me to say what will actually happen. It may well be that it does stay, but we put conditions in place that if it does go, we're expecting to see an increase in biodiversity value in that location. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, Councillor Brown. Oh. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just totally agree with um, what Councillor Sona said there about the pond. I hope the Council do see sense on this one because it flies in the face of the um, the green strategy review. We're supposed to be reconnecting residents to nature, and especially in that area, how dense it is. Um, we we actually need something like that saving mm -hmm. for the residents. It's great for mental health, mm -hmm. and I hope that it will be saved and common sense will prevail. Thanks, Chair. Um, the green blue infrastructure I, I refer to does have a section in there about how we can green the town centre. Looking how we how we can improve the the town centre. I know it, what what you're saying about the pond fly seems to fly in the face of that, but I think obviously what we what we need to look at is is the town centre as a whole. How we can improve that uh, environmental quality and improve the the green credentials of it. Thank you. Are there any other members wanting to make any comments or yeah, Councillor Furness? Yeah. We talked about uh, Martin Westbeck. It does run through my ward as well. Um, I'm having a few issues. I don't know if this is more your side, Paul, but it's nobody's claiming um, responsibility. There's like Japanese knotweed that runs along the back of some of the houses, um, and the councillor said it's the water authority. And I know, and I've got a, an email that said that actually the water authority said um, the residents have ripping uh, rights of the waterway so should can maintain it themselves and it's a bit confusing and, and then the last email i got well it's still in discussions between the council 13 and the water authority what is going to happen and who has responsibility and like obviously who's going to pay for it and i don't know if you know anything of that Paul. i i don't um it, it is out kind of outside my remit as well but i'm i'm happy to try and follow that with people if i can i can't yeah. promise you that i'll um identify an outcome or solution for you um, but clearly there, there are probably other agencies who are very interested as well so things like the environment agency um, as well potentially but certainly um, we, we I, I can have to, I can follow that up internally see what's happening with that um, but it, it doesn't really fall on my shoulders in terms of my remit okay thanks Paul 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't see any other hands up. Um, just before we move on, I just want to make a quick comment myself, Paul, just to say, uh, I think it's a positive thing to hear council officers talk about management and maintenance of, of green areas, because I, I know, or, or I, I gather there was quite a substantial amount of resources that were spent after the storm um, of the weekend, clearing up uh, fallen trees and, and things like that. Um, and I think residents, or at least the residents that contact me, kind of feel that it's more of a reactive approach rather than a proactive approach. So I think at least to, to hear that language is, is a positive thing. So, yeah, um, uh, that's it for that agenda item. So you're welcome to stay or, or leave, Paul. Um, completely up to you. But th thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, <laughs> Richard. Hi. Um, you're the next agenda item, which is... So empty and derelict. Hello? Hi. Hello. You, you, you broke up a bit there. Sorry, Richard. Hi, sorry. sorry. Yeah, um, everything seemed to uh, go a little bit. So I, I gather um, you're doing the next presentation on I saw empty yes. and derelict commercial properties. And um, yes. I'll hand it over. Thank you. Oh, just to check, Richard, you want questions at the end? Um, well, I'm going to put a presentation on that's only about five slides. Any it, Anybody who wants to shout out during that, that's fine. It's just I. When I put it on the screen, I can't really see people, so they'd have to shout it. So questions anytime, that, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Right, can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. right. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly just to, to kind of set the context and then obviously take take whichever questions. Um, the presentation again. Right, that's better. So we've got, essentially, we've got £2 million allocated to this issue. We've got two pots of a million. Um, one was allocated in relation to eyesore sites and one was allocated in relation to Effectively, I saw properties, um, but what we really need to do with that money is focus on the ones that are causing problems in communities, because as I'm sure we'll get into, there are ISO sites and there are ISO properties and problem properties all over town as there are all over every town. Um, and we can't possibly deal with all of them. So there's a little bit of targeting um, around that money. But what we're trying to do really is not just say that the money is the solution there's a there's essentially a flow chart that that we have um which sets out what we need to do to try and get those buildings or those sites back into productive use and and the last thing in there should be applying some of that money um because obviously a lot of these uh, virtually all of them are in private ownership and the people who own them have got a responsibility to do something about them so we always look at reminding them of those responsibilities and trying to enforce those responsibilities as the first part of call. And then obviously, as we progress through that, that chain of actions, purchasing the site or investing money in the site is, is obviously at the back end of there. We would also always try to achieve any kind of purchase through negotiation, but ultimately we do retain that threat of, if it comes to it, we could, potentially pursue a CPO for these. I'm just conscious that um, sometimes CPO gets used as a as a almost a first stage when really it's the end of a chain of actions. So in terms of using the allocations on the one, the million pounds for the properties, we're working through Middlesbrough Development Company um, to, to deliver this. Now, they're looking to work with a number of partners, but the one they have signed up at the moment is Ethical Lettings. Um, so some of that money will be spent purchasing properties. Some of it will be spent on refurbishing properties that have been purchased, and then we'll be getting those let um, through Ethical Lettings and any other partners that come on board. And the focus for that money is TS1 and TS3 specifically. Now, each of those purchases will be based on a business case, to say, you know, we've we've tried everything else. 
um, there is some sort of future for that property and therefore we would suggest that we buy it through MDC, get it refurbished and get it let with, with a kind of longer term, more sustainable tenant. On the sites, the million pounds that's allocated for that, again, it could be MDC that, that do some of that, but it also might be Middlesbrough Council that, that does some of that. And it's about identifying the ones that we can't do the enforcement on or it isn't getting us anywhere. Excuse me. And again, that where we do see a viable future for them. So that might be about the site being purchased and then sold straight on to a third party, whether that be a, a registered provider or social housing landlord or, or whatever. Um, but that could be anywhere across the town. It's not restricted by geography. There's a few realities, however, and, and this is the kind of myth busting that, that, that is useful for us. When we've brought this previously to executive or to previous scrutiny committees, people will suggest sites and, and that's fine. If somebody suggests a site, we'll absolutely have a look at it. But there isn't a, a categorization of it's on the list or it's not on the list because there's probably in reality multiple lists and we, we just kind of compare notes on these on a regular basis. So being, there's no kind of designation of, oh, it's on the list, it's therefore being taken care of because obviously resources and capacity comes into it. The million pounds, certainly around the sites, won't go very far. We could probably tie that money up on two or three sites quite easily. And the circumstances around the ownership of those sites changes. We end up in situations where somebody's not prepared to deal with us. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, they'll they'll suggest a figure that they're prepared to move it on for. So that will change its priority as things happen. And also negotiations will change. There's some where we are talking to people and they're saying, oh, not, not going to sell it, not going to sell it. And, and they're suggesting ridiculous figures. Again, those things will change over time as people's position changes and that will move a site you know, closer to being purchased or further away from being purchased. So I'm, I'm very keen that we don't kind of make too many promises about yours is third on the list, therefore it'll be the third one dealt with because it, it really doesn't work like that. The obvious thing is that we can't do everything, that the money just isn't there to, to address all of the sites that we're aware of. But these last two points, I guess, are very much around how we address them. Enforcement is really difficult. There's a lot of legal aspects to this and we can serve various notices on people, but we have to meet certain criteria to do that. There has to be um, evidence on the site of certain things being the case, particularly around things like security and danger and, and things like that. And quite often serving the notice it can be a little bit tokenistic if there isn't the, the evidence behind it and the connection to the person that owns the site to allow us to, to force it through. So we can quite often take action and do some of the work ourselves and then bill the owners for that. But that doesn't mean we're going to recover the money. There's, there's loads of, of legal issues that, that play into that. So enforcement's always the first option and it's always our favoured option. But again, I wouldn't want to sit here and give anybody the impression that just because we say something can be um, looked at means that enforcement will actually stick because it, it's quite a difficult thing to make it stick. And then finally on there, CPO is not an easy option. It's, it's quite easy to say to somebody who owns a site, you know, we want to do a deal with you, but if we don't get one, you know, we, we do have CPO as, a, as an option in the longer term. It is the longer term and there's an awful lot of planning needs to go into a CPO and a lot of um, there's a lot of legal loopholes to jump through. So it, it exists as an option and it exists as a threat. Um, we've got to be very sure that we'll we'll get there um, with the CPO before pursuing it properly. So, again, it's just so that, that members are aware that we would always pursue enforcement, can't always make it stick. Um, and if necessary, we will pursue a CPO. We are, um, we're not scared of doing that. And we have done it on occasions. It's just, it's not, it's not that easy. It's not a very easy or certainly not a very quick solution.
There are some others that, that we're obviously aware of and obviously involved in that sit outside of these allocations, purely because these allocations would never be big enough to, to deal with. Um, we've got a number of large buildings. I've just put a few examples there. There are others. Um, but big properties within the town centre usually and, and, and just outside where we are engaged in active discussions with the owners. Um, we'll always push for something to be done on there, but the solution having a, a degree of sympathy for the owners, the solution is always going to be a very expensive one. It's not like, um, you know, a small site that's worth 90,000 pounds that, that that somebody's just got within a portfolio of other sites they own that can be sold on and cleared and, and something built on it. These are big, problematic, lumpy and expensive buildings. Um, so the solution for them is not easy to find. So again, we're in active discussions with the owners um, of, of sites like this and, and buildings like this. But again, it's just so that we're clear that we can we can discuss a lot of things with them, but ultimately a finance package has to be put in there. And sometimes we'll get involved in that, sometimes we won't. And then just to finish, finish the presentation, really just to show that things can happen and things can be done. Um, an example here, couldn't find a picture of the before situation, but you'll have, you'll have to take my word for it. It wasn't very nice. Um, problem site at Tollsby Shops cause of a lot of, of grief for the residents. Um, through MDC, the council have stepped in and, and bought the site and have put forward a, a plan which is now being delivered on the ground for 24 apartments and five retail units. It should be ready sometime in the summer of 2022. And obviously that will make a huge difference to that community. Now, some of these schemes may turn a profit. Some of them will make a loss. And, and Tollsby is probably a good example where actually the investment will be doing well just to get the investment returned. Um, but it's the impact on the community that means it's worth doing that expenditure and that investment. So that's just an example of one where we have picked it up. We have done something with it. But that predates these two allocations, so that's been done out of other council funding. And then it was just to, to throw it open for any questions, so I'll, I'll unshare my presentation so I can see everyone. Thanks, you, uh, Councillor Arundel. Morning, Richard. As you know, I sit on MDC and have been involved with some of this stuff. Uh, might may seem obvious a question to ask, but it, maybe it's a difficult one. And perhaps you might not be able to answer. How do you identify a site as being high? So, I think when we took we took a report originally to executive to say we were going to get tougher with ISO sites and and properties. It wasn't the one where we allocated the money that that followed on, and we we set out what you could say were criteria. We did they weren't as hard and fast as that. But essentially, it's things where we receive a lot of complaints. It's buildings or, or sites where we can see that there are a visual scar on the community. And it's things where we believe that something needs to happen. Now, that's all very subjective. And, and that's why, in some respects, the list isn't that important. Uh, it's important that we have a list and it's important that people flag them up and we look at them. But it's very difficult to go down the list and say that that site is worse than the other site or that property needs dealing with before that one. Because quite often the circumstances around the site is the bit that gives it the priority. If it's an absent landlord and it's something that they're never going to do anything with, it's difficult to make progress. If it's somebody where the site's possibly not as bad, but it's still a concern, but we know they're willing to do a deal, then it's a lot easier to make progress. So we, we don't have hard and fast criteria. A lot of it is subjective. And, and I think the one thing we would say is that if somebody proposes something to go on, on the, the long list, we're not really interested in screening it out. If, it, if it's on there because people are concerned, we'll have a look at it. Thank you. Uh, next was Councillor Saunders. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I've got two really, but... Uh... If you let me yeah I, I just uh, just a general question there uh, Richard really these um, derelict sites obviously I don't want to go into ward issues but we've got a, a number of them there 
do these owners have to have insurance on these um, on these all these derelicts? I obviously, and are they liable if you know if anybody tras trespasses? I know trespasses is illegal, but would they be liable if the, if these trespassers were injured on these sites? Uh, that's a very good question, and it's probably one where there's a number of different answers. No, I don't believe they have to have insurance. Some of them will have it, but but I don't think a lot of them will. And I think that it's a very, it's not a very easy answer for me to give in terms of, uh, yes, they are liable, no, they're not liable. It probably depends what steps they've taken to secure the site. So we know that there are some cases where we can um we can do some enforcement and serve various notices because the site is it's possible to access the site and there is stuff on the site that is potentially dangerous for people so you know if there are things that could fall through things that could climb and all that kind of stuff that's usually an avenue that we use but it's it's again it's one of those things that becomes quite subjective um it, it's an avenue for us to pursue and and i think quite often it's probably the one where we get the most joy in terms of trying to persuade them to, to at the very least, fence it properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I, it's just, a, and just a, lastly, Chair, just a comment really, you know, you mentioned these four big buildings, these I saw within the town, the Gurney House, Church House, the Crown and Sentinel, I think it's disgraceful for these companies because there must be large companies that own these, um, own these buildings and the length of time that these buildings have been derelict now i think it's an absolute disgrace and it's just a shame that the council can't do any more about it mm -hmm. it really is thanks chair do, do, do you want to respond on that chair if you want me to it's, up to you. It, it, it's really just to say completely understand that point of view and, and agree with it um it, it comes back to that point i made in the presentation that it doesn't matter how heavy handed we get with somebody. The answer for each of those buildings is a very expensive one for somebody. And, and sometimes not suggesting this is the case, particularly with those, but we do have other sites in this situation that the people have ended up owning them, but don't have the financial wherewithal to do anything about it. So quite often we'll go and put pressure on them. And, and the, the response we get is, well, I'll do something with it if you'll give me the money. And there are some circumstances where that works because we've got grants and other things, but a lot of the time it doesn't. And if it's not commercially viable, they just will not do it. So it, it leaves the council in a position where um, if the building doesn't require some degree of enforcement, in other words, if you look at Centre North East, there's nothing there that we can enforce because it's, it's a safe, sound, solid building. It's just not got an occupier in it. And, and it's not particularly cosmetically attractive. So the only thing that will happen with Centre North East to change the situation is, is a significant investment in the building. So as I say that because the solutions are so large, they're not going to happen very easily. And it, it's something that we do work with the owners on. We do push them. And every now and again, as you'll have seen, the mayor will make a point in the press about, you know, this isn't good enough. But ultimately, a lot of the solutions are going to be very difficult to find. Thanks, Richard. Cheers, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Coop. Thanks, Chair. Um, just want to briefly touch on things like graded listed buildings, like grade two listed buildings, about enforcing them. Uh, there's quite a few in the town. There's some in my ward, one in particular, which is leaves a lot to be desired. It, it's, you know, people buy these grade two listed buildings and then either run out of money, don't have the money. What's the council policy about that? Because I get a lot of complaints about things like that uh, and it need pursuing, properly pursuing and trying to get some mm -hmm. proper answers out of the owners. Because if you've got one which is a, a centre of an area and it's 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 really an appalling state, it's only going to get worse. And surely things like a grade two listed building should be protected. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh... I'm going to dodge that question slightly, but, but I'll, I'll try and answer it as best I can. The, there's, there is a lot of legislation around the, the, the grading of, of buildings and what you can and can't do, um, as there is with, with things that aren't listed in that, that sense. The reason why it falls down at our end is the resource to be able to do anything about it. So 
I'm acutely aware that I think probably over the last six to nine months, we've had a lot more, and it may be because we've raised these issues through the ISO site stuff. We've had a lot more um, complaints from councillors, from members of the public and, and from others about the state of a particular building. And, and some of them are listed, some of them are not. And we've got so little resource to do something about it that, that it looks like we're doing nothing. Um, so one of the things that I'm acutely aware of is enforcement falls into about two or three different directorates and the ability to do something about it. And we agreed over the last couple of weeks that, that collectively we're not doing enough. So I would agree wholeheartedly where there's a, a listed building that has issues that should be enforced, we should absolutely be doing something about it because the policy is there to be able to allow us to do it. The bit that isn't there is the capacity. So we're going to look internally at how do we pull the various elements of the council that have got some responsibility around enforcement to get a more effective service because it's it's currently it's doing what it can but what it can doesn't amount to a huge amount so i, I understand certainly with yourself and with other councillors we've probably had a degree of frustration that we haven't been able to act on some of these and that's that's something we need to do something about because at the moment the policy response is there the actual follow-up and, and the legality end of it is is not so much. So I've dodged that question, I think, by saying that the policies are in place. It, it's the staff resource that isn't that we need to do something about it. Just one last comment on that. Am I right in thinking there's a difference between saying a uh, grade two and a grade two star listed building? The, the difference in enforcement is, is quite quite noticeable. I, I'm not technically on top of all that, but I assume that will be the case. And again, something that we need to factor in is there are enforcement issues that, you know, there's always more enforcement issues that we can deal with and we need to prioritise them. What I'm not sure of, and I'll, I'll certainly ask and, and look at, is where listing actually comes within how we prioritise them. Because it may be that we should be prioritising more of our resource on protecting some of those listed buildings than we currently do. But that's something I'll have to look into. Thanks, Thank Chair. On, on my list next, I've got Councillor Morton and then Councillor Branson. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, just to follow up on, on Councillor Saunders' comments about insurance for buildings, um, referred to trespass and fencing off there are four main buildings that cannot be fenced off and the threat is to externally and the crown is one in particular these are three uh, uh, relatively modern buildings but the crown is an old building lots mm -hmm. of old stonework decorative stonework on it that's where i envisage problems rather than trespassers being injured the danger to people passing by that building and that's 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 more concern um appreciate the the difficulties in, in carrying out enforcement we all appreciate the work you're doing you and your staff are doing but the people are not aware of the difficulties we are facing regarding the buildings what we can do and what we can't do and how long it takes i think possibly and and when a statement's made that we're looking at this cpo for the um makes it sound quite easy I think if we were to mm -hmm. um, publicise what needs to be done, what can be done, and how difficult it is, we'll make people appreciate the fact that Middlesbrough Council is doing something, attempting to do something, because they don't see the buildings being dealt with, which indicates to some people that we're doing nothing. And, and I, mm -hmm. I say we know that you and your staff are, and, are doing something, and the pitfalls are horrendous. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I, I appreciate that was just a comment, and I think you've probably already addressed some of the themes there, Richard, haven't you? So, I, um... If I could just briefly say, I, again, I completely agree. I think one of the things I would like to be able to do is publicise the process that we would need to go through, to, to, to the steps we would look to prioritise to go through to deal with a, an ISO site or an ISO property, just so that we can almost get that message across that there's a there is an escalation process in there you know we can write to anybody 
that owns a site or a, a property and say, we'd like you to do something about it. But most of the people that own them know the law, know what they ca we can and can't do. And we almost have to do the dance, if you like, of going through the various stages and, and you know, ev everything we do that we want them to do will cost them money, so they'll resist. And, and it, it would be good to get across that there is a number of steps in this process that we have to follow, but there are tools that the council has. It's, I, I think the frustrating bit for the public particularly, and frustrates us that the public don't get to understand this is, people will see a building that's in a terrible state and say, well, why don't you do something about it? But actually, if it's secure and you can't get in it and, and, and all the other boxes that would have to tick, there's nothing we can do. And, and I think sometimes getting that message across frustrates people that there's nothing we can do. So it would be good to, it would be good to educate people at the same time as doing that by, by publishing that if we can. Sorry, I, I couldn't take myself off mute there. Uh, Councillor David Branson. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things, really. First of all, the point has been made, and I think very valid, uh, that probably the biggest danger with these buildings, if they are secure, is things falling off them, or as we've seen in the recent storm, being blown off them. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that maybe we should be looking to do, if we can, not always possible, is to make sure that the area around these buildings is fenced off. Um, so people can't get access to an area which could be dangerous. It may or may not be possible. Uh, it depends on who owns the land. Um, and, but I think that that's what we should be trying to do. Otherwise, what we're going to get is a member of the public is going to be hit on the head by uh, something falling off these buildings, which are deteriorating over time, and they're going to sue us. Um, and they're going to say that, that we should have ensured that the the pavement, for example, because they'll be work, walking on the pavement, is safe. Uh, and and uh, although we may be able to join the uh, owners of the building as co-defendants, I'm sure we would do that in any civil action, uh, it doesn't alter the fact that we're going to have to be party to that action uh, itself. I think the, the, the bigger problem you, you've touched on, Richard, and it, and it is a really very serious one. Um, with property prices rising, it is simply not in the interest of many of these owners of properties to do anything with the building. They're just hoping that at some stage in the future, they'll be able to realise a profit on this. Um, they've got huge resources. Uh, there's no way we can take them on, and they know that time well. Um, so what we really have to do is to go through central government here. We, we have to put pressure on the central government, through our MPs, through the Association of Local Councils, and say, look, uh, this is a problem for all of us. We cannot deal with this problem if developers um, have a financial incentive in simply doing nothing. And we could also point out that, as I was saying at the beginning, if this continues, the problem is actually going to be not just the buildings deteriorate, but more and more people injured by pieces falling off those deteriorating buildings. Um, so really the government has to take action here we, we can't do anything as local authority i'm afraid we're stuck uh it, it has to be action at the higher level can i come back on that chair yeah. I, I, again completely agree i think one of the issues that the public don't appreciate um if you see a large building sat empty it is kind of well why why would you own a building that size and not be doing something with it but if the business rates legislation allows them to to get it out of the the listing and, and therefore they're not paying business rates on it. It it doesn't particularly cost them anything and they will sit and sit and sit and wait either for the market to change or for somebody to come along who's, you know, and to put it bluntly, a lot of people have the business model of, well, I'll just sit on this till the council come knocking. And, and that's something we obviously have to be acutely aware of. I think one of the other issues in the town, and it, you know, it's possibly a, an issue everywhere, is a lot of these sites seem to have changed hands around about 2008 when the credit crunch happened. So we've got a lot of sites where we put pressure on people to say, you know, you need to do something with it. And they say, I'd love to get rid of it. We say, how, how much did you pay for it? They tell us, and your eyes start watering because people have bought right at the top of the market. Now, property prices and, and, and the 
you know, the value of land is obviously going up again, but they've bought it for such ridiculous prices that they're never going to realise a profit on it. So if it's not costing them anything, it will just sit there. And I think something that we have to be acutely aware of, whether it's the council or whether it's MDC or whoever, is we might have to pay over the odds to get some of these properties. It might be difficult to justify the valuation that we have to pay, but if we don't, it'll sit there forevermore. So that that's something that obviously when we do do that, we'll we'll flag that up. And, and, and if we're putting stuff through executive where we are looking to take control of a building or a site, we might have to pay a lot more than that than it's actually worth because that's what they've ended up doing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much on that. I think am I right in saying that the, the ownership has passed to different types of company as well? Um, is that a factor that, that these are companies that that are larger, more have more resources? You'll know better than me on them. It, it's probably a mix, actually, councillor. We've we've got a few. And I won't name the sites, but we've got a few where they've been, they've they've exchanged hands a few times offshore. Um, mm, yeah, that's and, what I'm thinking. And, and and you would question sometimes why they've changed hands quite at the high value they have. Um, but obviously that's that's something we're not involved in, and, and and we'll never get answers on. And and sometimes they're still in that situation. We know we're dealing with some that are, but equally one of the key sites we're dealing with, it's passed around a number of overseas ownerships and has now ended up with somebody local who's bought it. But again, they've bought it at the wrong time, massively overpaid for it, and they haven't got the resources to do something with it. So it, all, all of the buildings that we deal with are largely in, in different sets of circumstances, but ultimately the, the problem's still the same. The people who are sat with them have a higher idea of its value than than we probably would it's a national issue we we, we can't mm. tackle mm. Thanks very much. We, i don't want to give people the impression that we can't tackle any of it but we can't tackle all of it definitely thank you richard um we'll leave that topic there thank you very much for coming today richard really appreciate it no thank you um, the next agenda item is agenda item six which is the date of the next meeting uh, um which is the 12th of january 2022 um just want to bring up the two agenda items that we'll be looking at for that particular um meeting the first one is on bus services and i just want to ask any any panel members of um ideas about who we should invite because the most obvious ones are the bus operators uh stagecoach and arriva but i think it's about thinking I'd like to inform it by what what end outcome we'd like to have from that sort of meeting, and um, I've, maybe the TVCA might be an option, given that they do have a, a sort of an overarching uh, portfolio for transport for the region as well. So, is there any any input from any members in terms of uh, potential people to invite for that meeting? Uh, Councillor David Branson, yeah. Yeah, um, this is a particular interest of mine. Um, it has to be the TVCA that we invite um, simply because um, they um, are the people that at the end of the day have the financial means to support the uh, system. Um, I, I also wonder whether this is something that we could involve one of the MPs in. I don't know whether we have the remit to do that, but we've never, I've never seen a committee where we've done that, but uh, it is a national issue. Um, We've got a bus service improvement plan that has come out very, very recently. And if you read that, you, I think, come very quickly to the conclusion that Teesside has one of the worst public transport systems, probably in the UK. Uh, I would actually say probably in Western Europe in terms of a metropolitan area, not a rural area, of course. Um, very, very difficult to deal with because of the nature of Teesside. Um, uh, we can get the bus companies along, but they're only going to say, we'll run this, but only if you give us some money. <laughs> so at the end of the day, really going to get the people there that have got the money. Uh, so Tom Bryant from the TVCA, or ideally Ben Houchin from the TVCA, I think we should have at that meeting. But I on honestly wonder whether this is, again, something that we have limited power over and whether we need to be talking about uh, uh, MPs being there um uh, but particularly government MPs. I don't know whether that's feasible, but I'm planning to. 
Yeah, there is any other input from any any other panel members on that? No, I, I Councillor Coop. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do agree with Councillor Bronson regarding that. I think the, the, we need a policy in the south of the town, which we have been involved um, as the south of town expands, Hemington Grange, Corby, etc. Um, there's not quite the infrastructure there, uh, and things have a nasty habit of saying, "Well, we put everything in." Oh, oh yes, let's think about the infrastructure. Let's let's put a bus route in. No, you do that first. Um, whether you uh, have the roads prepared or whatever, but you do need a comprehensive plan because otherwise people just leap in the car. So I, I would agree with that. And I think quite right. Uh, we need to get the TVCA in, involved, perhaps a local MP and things like that. That could be difficult being it's parliament week. But um, I think, yes, I agree. I think the TVCA and, and we'll look at a proper strategy. The bus companies would agree with us. They, they obviously, it's in their interest to have buses in the south of the town, etc. But of course, it's money and that's what it's purely down to. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Arendelle. Yes, Chair, it's not on this subject, but I'd just like, if you could, to stay when you close the meeting. What? What happened there? Something happened there and the screen popped off. But if you can stay at the end of the meeting, I'd like to have a chat with you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Arendelle. Um, just very quickly as well, in the next meeting, uh, the next, we are going to stay on the green strategy and um, the topic we looked at today regarding uh, land use and wildlife. Um, we're thinking about inviting local groups to that meeting with ideas that they've got to maybe then pass on to the council. Um, if there's any any objections to that from anyone, if anyone's got any sort of input, um, just to maybe email me and let me know about that, if that's okay. Uh, there's a lot of different local groups. And one of the things I'm quite conscious of is that sometimes there's, there can be some politics involved in that, which obviously is inherently what we are, what we are um, as as a scrutiny panel as a scrutiny panel anyway. But if anyone does have any ideas or input, just to email me if that's okay. Um, the next agenda item is agenda item number seven, which is the overview and scrutiny board update. Um, the meeting of the overview and scrutiny board was held on Tuesday, the 9th of October. Sorry, that can't be correct. Sorry, um, that must be November. Um, I, I made a very quick note there, but it must be Tuesday, the 9th of November. We had a presentation from Executive Councillor Barry Cooper, but because of the scale of his portfolio, the presentation and questions were focused on environment. Um, in, it, in the presentation, the executive member gave a, an overview of his portfolio, which in broad terms were outlined as environment services, highways and infrastructure and property and commercial services. The executive member then outlined his portfolio, his, his, his goals um, within his portfolio, which included the development and implementation of a green strategy and um, the transport and bridge. The executive member then discussed what he will be focused on specifically for next year, and this included again investment in the transport or bridge and also exploring the outcome of the environment bill and its uh, outcomes for, for Middlesbrough specifically. We then had a presentation from the chief executive focused on COVID statistics, Middlesbrough council staff engagement levels and an overall performance summary of the council uh, within his analysis of strategic plan outcomes, the chief exec did note that the re reduction of green waste collections has significantly improved recycling performance, almost back to pre, almost back to levels before the pandemic. Uh, finally, I presented I presented our panel's final report on Middlesbrough uh, regeneration post COVID, Middlesbrough financial re regeneration um, after COVID nineteen which was passed on to the executive and the full meeting is available to watch on the council's YouTube channel. Um, is there any, any questions from that or is, it, is, that, is that okay? Um, I'm going to move on then. That's fine. Thank you very much. And uh, any uh, the, the last agenda item is any other urgent items. I'm not aware of any. Um, so for me, that would be the close of the meeting. And thank you very much to, to those members still in attendance. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Bye. Bye.